Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General Hospital. Today's program is part of our Mass General for Children Parenting Series, a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General for Children. Before we get started, I just want to go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that you are in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so we can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, you may use the chat feature, which is located above your screen. We'll have time for them in the end. Only Blum Center staff, our co-host and guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Lastly, at the end of today's session, you'd be directed to a brief survey, which we'd like to ask you to help us complete. Your feedback is important to us as we plan future programs. Okay, so next I'm going to turn it over to Brianna Beckwell. She is the project manager and editor for Mass Channel for Children, and she will introduce you all to today's guest speaker. Thank you, Amy. All right, so thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon, and I hope you're all doing well. This session is part of the MGFC Parenting Series, where experts from Mass General for Children share their knowledge and expertise on a variety of pediatric health topics. This year, we're co-hosting the series with the Blum Patient and Family Learning Center at Mass General. So before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our speaker. Uh, we have Justine Delaria, who is a social worker on the child protection team at Mass General for Children. Uh, she'll discuss the difference between conflict and bullying, the impact that bullying has on youth and what can protect children from bullying or increase their risk, whether they are the victim or the perpetrator. She'll also discuss how to prevent bullying, laws and policy in place around bullying, and how to respond to known or suspected bullying behavior. Justine earned her master's degree in social work from the Boston College Graduate School of Social Work. And from here, I'll hand it over to Justine. Thank you, Brianna and Amy. I really appreciate it. Um, okay, let me share the screen. See my screen. Great. So um, as Brianna was saying, I am Justine Delaria. I am a social worker at Mass General Hospital. Um, I am on our child protection team, and I can tell you a little bit more about that team. Um, so the child protection program was developed in 2000. It's a multidisciplinary team of doctors and social workers. We're available 24 seven. We provide just as an overview, some clinical consultation, education and training around child maltreatment, policy and program development, and some research that we've been working in. So today, just jumping right into it, um, as uh, Brianna had said earlier, we're going to be talking about a few different things, conflict and bullying, then visiting the impact that it has, what increases the risk of bullying, what can protect children from bullying, warning signs to be able to identify bullying, some laws and policies in place specific to Massachusetts, how to prevent bullying, and then how to respond of known or suspecting bullying behavior. Just to start us off um, to better understand the difference between conflict and bullying. Um, both are still um, the responsibility of the school to solve an issue between students, um, but particularly conflict usually starts with friendship and then some situation occurs. Um, it's usually back and forth in nature, meaning kids are friends and then they come into conflict and then they are friends and they come into conflict again. And um, generally only the two students are involved in this conflict. Um, in terms of better defined bullying, bullying is more so a repeated and intentional behavior. It's to inflict harm or distress on the other student. And um, the main differentiation is a power imbalance between student, students, excuse me. Um, they're not evenly matched opponents per se. Uh, bullying truly isn't about resolving conflict. It's more about control um, and power differentiation. So a little bit more to understand bullying, it is a repeated over time um, behavior or it has the potential to be repeated. Um, it does inflict harm or distress, things like making threats or spreading rumors. 
Um, it could be attacking another with physical force or words, things like, um, you know, difference in physical strength, uh, excluding from a group on purpose, um, things like, uh, you know, people being outnumbered, use of weapons, significant power imbalance of size, popularity, ability, wealth, background, or demographics. Bullying can be both indirect or direct um, and typically, typically takes the form of either verbal, which is teasing or calling names, social, like we're saying before, spreading rumors or excluding others, breaking up friends purposely, physical, inflicting intentional physical harm on somebody else or another student, hitting, punching, or shoving, or cyberbullying, um, the use of technology to harm others. Technology being texting, internet, email, creating a blog or a web page. Um, some statistics just to keep in mind. Um, bullying is common and uh, negatively impacts all youth involved, the bully, the bullier, and the witnesses of bullying. Um, one in five high school students reported being bullied at school in the last year, and more than one in six high school students reported cyberbullying. Um, we do know that some youth experience bullying more than others, particularly LGBTQ. Uh, we do see bullying uh, and cyberbullying in high school happening more to females and uh, bullying occurring for those who are unsure of their identity or sexual orientation. Uh, a little bit more of statistics. These come from the school crime and safety report that the CDC does nationally every four years, as well as the youth risk and behavior survey that's given out to grades, uh, eight, grade nine to 12 every four years as well. Um, in 2017, 20% of students reported bullying at school during the past school year, which aligns with our one in five that we were talking about before. Uh, higher percentages of female students report being bullied at school more than male students, and a higher percentage of female students than male students report being bullied online. So that's consistent with some of the statistics we were talking about. You can find these statistics online, and here are some graphs that they've put out, um, particularly for these. We do know that middle school um, have middle school students have the highest rate of reporting bullying on school. Um, you can see the first graph is percentage of students ages 12 to 18 who report being bullied at school during the year. Um, it's uh, differentiated by bullying type and the sex of the student. And then the second graph is also just um, some information among students ages 12 to 18 and the impact that they report bullying has on them. So if you'd like more information about this, you can check out um, the source of this, Department of Justice, uh, the school crime and supplement of the national crime victimization surveys that they do most recently in 2017. So bringing us to the impact of bullying and understanding what that is, as I had said before, bullying impacts all involved, those being bullied, those that are bullying, and the witnesses to um, being bullied, uh, witnesses to the bullying, excuse me. Uh, you know, the impact can be things like internalized problems, that's depression, anxiety, panic disorder, or uh, self-harm, psychosomatic problems, things like headaches, stomach aches or pains, sleeping problems, or poor appetite, academic issues, uh, externalizing behaviors, things like aggression or bullying um, or violence. And then, of course, the impact on the stress response system. We know that toxic stress impacts biologically um, the child and the structures within the brain. Um, this can, can impact things like memory and academic performance as well. Those that are bullied report uh, low self-esteem, significant isolation, poor school performance, having fewer friends, and having a negative view of school. Those that are bullying others are at higher risk of substance use disorder, academic problems, and experiencing violence later in adolescence and adulthood. And those that witness bullying are more likely to use tobacco, alcohol, or other drugs, have increased mental health issues, skip school, or miss school.
So some of the risk factors to this have to do with different domains, both individual, family, school, community, or peer. Uh, when we're talking about individual, we're talking about somebody's temperament, uh, the presence of a disability, social skills, uh, any sort of isolation or sexual orientation. When we're thinking about risk factors of family, thinking about disengaged parenting, um, significant family conflict, substance use disorder, um, domestic violence in the home, any incarcerated parents um, or child maltreatment. Risk factors associated with school um, have to do with school climate, a sense of belonging to the school, degree of the respect or being fairly treated within the school, adult supervision, um, and awareness or responsiveness of staff. When thinking about community, we're talking about neighborhood safety, uh, connection to adults in that neighbor. Do um, neighbors know the students? Do they know the children in the neighborhood? And thinking about peer influence, of course, having to do with any sort of delinquent behaviors, aggressive behaviors, violence, or um, you know, a bullying from those in the peer group. And with risk factors always comes protective factors and the consideration of strengths um, that uh, are more protective. For individual and family, they're gonna look opposite of what we were just talking about. Things like um, secure attachment, self-confidence, caring and supportive parenting, positive relationships and constant and affectionate parent-child interactions. When you're thinking about peer and school protective factors, um, engaged and responsive teachers, inclusive and safe schools, positive school climate, closely supervised by staff. And um, the communities that we see of, that are protective are ones that have cultural norms and beliefs that are pro-social and non-violent uh, with positive adult and child connections as well as safe neighborhoods. You may be thinking with all of this information, how might I uh, be able to uh, see warning signs of bullying that's happening, either um, someone bullying or being bullied. And the warning signs are pretty consistent. Um, having a dislike of school or refusal to go to school, significant stomach aches or other physical complaints from the child, uh, problems with eating and sleeping, negative self-talk or self-harm or loss of confidence for some reason, uh, loss of friends or a change in friends, that being sudden, um, unexplained damage or loss of clothing or other personal items, some evidence of physical abuse, bruises, scratches, um, any sort of physical harm evidence, sudden negative change in behavior, um, any sort of increase in depression, anxiety, fear, or panic of the child, and risky behavior taking, reports of your child bullying others, or significant increase in aggression um, are likely warning signs of something going on. Um, with this, I wanted to mention uh, bullying and media coverage because I'm sure um, those of us have heard of different incidents and significant things happening in different areas. Um, one of the sort of influences of media coverage could be, you know, the ways in which it really influences public view on the world. Um, so some things to be careful of is there are many times in which um, media coverage can overstate the problem. Rates uh, nationally of bullying have not increased. Um, stating or implying that bullying causes suicide is very risky. Um, most young people do not support bullying and suicide is very complex and multifaceted. Um, bullying could be one of many factors of something that happens for a child. It is not a linear cause or reason for self-harm. Um, it can definitely worsen feelings of isolation, depression, or despair for somebody, but the vast majority of children that experience bullying do not become suicidal. Part of the problem of this um, linkage through media coverage from sensationalizing it or blaming or criminalizing those that bully is it could lead to the belief 
of this being of suicide being a normative result of bullying, which actually works against the greater community. It can be seen as a contagion. Um, normalizing that it's a result of bullying could actually add to additional deaths or clustered self-harm. So it's important to pay attention to coverage and just beware of um, some of the pitfalls of when this happens. Um, it's usually very much so a dramatic element of a, of a coverage story um, to rope you know, listeners in um, and really ensuring that we're understanding that piece of things. Um, the, the last thing is that it usually excludes prevention information and resources, which is the most important for intervention in something like this. Some myths associated with bullying that you might hear that it's a rite of passage for those. Um, bullying is not a rite of passage for anyone. It is a serious threat to student safety. Also sort of the saying that the struggle makes you stronger. We know that bullying increases negative effects of emotional and physical health for all involved. So steering clear of these myths are really important. There is a significant reluctance with reporting and a lot of people wonder why that is. Um, about 50 to 75% of children do not actually tell school personnel, but are more likely to tell parents. Why might that be? Um, typically negative messages about tattling or snitching can interfere, concern for retaliation, different gender stereotypes and what's expected from them or social norms around that. Um, and then lack of confidence of adult action. So this varies by age and gender. Usually older youth and boys are more reluctant to report bullying. It's really important to have trusted, strong adult connections with children so that they feel confident in disclosing when something is happening. This brings us into really considering and thinking about the laws that are in place around bullying and child safety with bullying. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services in 2000 really did a lot of public service and public took a public health approach to prevent bullying, to raise awareness of bullying as a serious problem. And a lot of there were uh, it, interventions and sort of awareness really worked. Um, we know it worked because awareness is high right now of bullying. Many people agree that it's a serious problem and don't believe that it should happen. Um, so we've seen a lot of reform in policy and practice over the year. Uh, sorry, over the years since 2000. Things like um, giving parents and caregivers the education and support needed to nurture and discipline in ways that are supportive, incorporating social skills training in social emotional lessons in classrooms, coordinating intervention strategies, um, different ways to reduce risk within communities, and realizing that violence is a learned behavior. In other words, what adults do um, children see and then do to each, each other. So um, there are some federal laws specifically, especially around um, civil rights, and those are listed here um, with the Civil Rights Act of 64, prohibiting discrimination based on race, color, and national origin, the educational amendments of 72, prohibiting discrimination based on sex, and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and the American with Disabilities Act of the 1990 prohibits discrimination based on disability. So federally, um, it was also looked at to understand how bullying of these protected classes is also a civil rights violation. And with that, it brings us to more um, policy uh, of harassment and harassment is typically um, happens when bullying of bias, prejudice, or hate occurs. Harassment creates a hostile environment when conduct is sufficiently severe, pervasive, or persistent, and it interferes with or limits a student's ability to participate or benefit from services. When harassment is based on race, color, national origin, sex, or disability, as we said, it violates civil rights and there can be police involvement when this happens. Harassment differs a little bit from bullying because it does not have to include intent to harm. 
It does not have to be directed at a specific target, and it does not have to involve repeated incidents. Um, the label used to describe the incident doesn't actually determine how a school responds, but it does uh, change the nature of conduct itself to be assessed for a civil right implication, meaning things like racial slurs, sexual harassment, sexually charged names, spreading rumors about sexual behavior, unwelcomed advances, gender-based harassment when somebody doesn't typically conform to stereotypical notions of how gender is expected, mannerisms or with extracurricular activities, um, or those with disability calling a student names like stupid or idiot um, that does have an intellectual disability. These require a different uh, report to the Department of Education and different intervention because it can be seen as harassment and there can be police involvement from these situations. This is a bit of a map nationally to understand policy and um, law that comes along uh, with different states and how they manage it. It is sort of funneled into the state to manage that. Massachusetts does have anti-bullying laws um, and student discrimination acts to prevent bias related bullying and other harassment of students and for um, school systems to respond effectively when it occurs. Uh, for our state law, this covers all of uh, the school districts, including charter schools, private and public schools, private special education schools, and day and residential schools. Um, our laws uh, especially came out in May of 2010, where um, the schools were directed to develop and implement a plan to address bullying prevention and intervention. It is regulated by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, or DESE, and our anti-bullying statute prohibits acts of bullying, cyberbullying, and retaliation in schools, at school function, or even outside of school, um, known as off-campus bullying. Uh, it uh, recognizes that bullying creates a hostile environment at school, for the victim of the bullying and can infringe on the civil rights of the victim as well. School districts are required to have a bullying prevention policy and plan in place to report bullying, to respond to bullying, and to notify the parents of those involved. There are mandates for regular staff trainings and curriculum for students, uh, both for professional development and to assist in the social emotional learning of students. And um, it must be reported, especially if it is harassment or a civil rights violation. So it brings us to discuss what the school responsibility is. And schools need to have these plans in place, both clear definitions of bullying, cyberbullying, and retaliation, procedures of how they're going to respond and what can be expected in a response of investigating this and um, a different discipline that may take, for, uh, may take uh, action afterwards. Procedures of how reports will be promptly responded to, the range of disciplinary actions like we talked about, procedures of restoring a sense of safety for the victims, as well as for the community at large. Um, and then procedures consistent with state and federal law to notify parents um, of the victim and the child responsible for, for uh, bullying and a strategy to provide counseling for all involved. Um, with school's responsibility, they do take into, considera into consideration age and appropriate curriculum and response to the bullying. Um, more vulnerable students are recognized in what they need, as we talked about, those protected classes, uh, the professional development that's needed for this level uh, or the level of education that they're providing. Um, and also the plan really naming the specific persons responsible to do and follow out all of these things. Um, that can be the principal or a particular social emotional learning um, professional staff person that's working at the school. Um, when bullying or retaliation is identified to have occurred, 
Um, there are specific steps laid out by DESE that schools have to follow, including notifying the parents or guardians of the target to the extent consistent with the state and federal law. What this means is it has to be um, and consider unique circumstances. For example, if bullying had occurred for uh, LGBTQ students and the student has not come out to their parents yet, this needs to be taken into consideration for the safety of the student and the impact of what that means of uh, disclosure of this bullying. Um, notify uh, the persons involved with the action taken to prevent any further acts of bullying or retaliation. With that, it's important to remember that the school does have to protect confidentiality. So parents may be identified that action was taken, but they may not know specifically who it was taken against, what action was taken, or what steps were put forth to remedy the situation, but more so assured that something has a plan, safety plan has put, been put in place and they are following through with that. They will also notify the parents or guardians of the aggressor and take uh, appropriate disciplinary action on that um, front as well. It's important to note, as we talked about harassment and the laws of protected persons, that due to um, certain protection classes, they do have to notify local law enforcement if they believe that a criminal charge could be pursued if civil rights of the person were impacted. Students with disabilities also have other protection. Their IEP or support team must consider and specifically address the skills and profession, proficiencies, excuse me, needed to avoid and respond to bullying or harassment or teasing, the skills and proficiencies needed to avoid and respond to bullying or harassment, and provide additional services promptly to the student. So this may look like different safety or support plans put in place, things like um, additional skill building that they may need, alternative measures um, that can be put in place, uh, help with participation behaviors, designated social skills groups, lunch groups or recreation groups for the student, who the student can go to with any problems, how to say what the problem is and speak up for themselves, and when to tell somebody when they need help. Um, one important thing to remember around texting, sexting, or the internet um, is that interactions that fit the description of bullying could be considered cyberbullying, even if it's not on the school campus. The school is required to treat this behavior the same way that it treats any other bullying. The sending of words or pictures could be breaking the law and police could get involved in these situations. No matter what is sent or what is intended, a text or email creates a record that the school or police will take seriously and will have to um, consider as cyberbullying. So this includes things like revenge porn or nude pictures that get sent among students. This brings us to thinking more about prevention and prevention comes in many different spheres. This is a preventing youth violence approach that the CDC puts out um, for, you know, more of the top tier, what communities can do and what the nation at large can do in terms of uh, prevention of youth violence. Things like um, promoting family environments that support healthy development, strengthening youth skills, creating positive community environments, and intervene to lessen the harms of uh, future risk. This is more sort of a broad scope of suggestion of what can be done amongst communities. When bringing it to the smaller community level, there are particular steps of suggestion of what can be done. Things like ensuring the positive social climate that we talked about before with the protective factors that we discussed. Ensuring that leaders of school systems, um, staff, youth programs, and parents are involved and engaged in these uh, anti-bullying efforts and um, pro-social behaviors, increasing adult supervision, which can look like, you know, ensuring that schools are having um, engaged staff along with what's going on, that parents are involved in uh, different school activities, 
um, with better supervision. Um, knowing your district's anti-bullying policy and prevention efforts and getting involved in that is really important. Considering referrals to mental health professionals when help is needed if you find out your child is bullying or being bullied. Um, and then spending time talking with children about bullying. There is a true um, effort around curriculum of anti-bullying and ensuring that prevention efforts, bystander intervention being the most effective um, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, and social emotional learning, um, as well as positive behaviors are increased and talked about. This brings us to thinking about what can you do as a parent? Um, if you believe that your child is being bullied, um, you can do things like support your child. Don't blame your child. Um, it will add to feelings of helplessness. Uh, ensuring that you know the procedure of the school, reading the school bullying prevention plan, understanding procedures and steps that the school could take when this is happening. Um, don't confront the other child or the family of the other child. Confronting can sometimes and most of the time make things worse. It can put your child at greater risk of physical violence or harm. And really ensuring to talk to the trusted school personnel involved in this get the school involved, report it as soon as you hear something happening, uh, taking things serious and talking through what the procedures are and what support your child can get from the school. Um, asking for help is the most important in these situations. Also encouraging the bystander um, intervention. <clears throat> Excuse me, if your child sees bullying, Encourage them if it's safe to stand up. Say something like, stop, don't bother them. Things like, um, that's not nice, or we don't talk like that. Um, remove the target from bullying if they don't want to directly say something, saying, come on, let's get out of here, and walking away with the person that's being bullied. Uh, report the bullying to other trusted adults within the school system or to yourself. Um, and really helping them and encouraging them to be a friend. Sit with the person um, that's been targeted at lunch. Walk with them between classes. Uh, bystander effect is one of the most influential effects to stop bullying. Being in a group it makes it much less likely for a child to be a target. This uh, choose kindness is uh, from the Disney Channel. Um, of a sort of PSA that runs in some of um, their commercials, remembering to uh, make it make the moment of kindness that wins. And together we can put an end to bullying. The bystander effect is one of the most effective ways to stop bullying for children. And of course, uh, we always get the questions of, um, if my child is bullying, what do I do? And there are plenty of things in which you can do. You can express to them that bullying is wrong and never okay. Make sure to place limits on their behavior and you know, express to them clear expectations, uh, clear consequences of any acts of aggression or bullying that you see or become aware of, ensuring that you're enforcing those consequences. Uh, seeking help if the bullying doesn't stop Talk to your child's school counselor or administrator that helps with these things for additional assistance. Get help for your child. Mental health um, intervention, counseling. Uh, make it clear that you take bullying seriously, that you will not tolerate this behavior. Develop clear and consistent rules within your family for your child's behavior. Praise and reinforce your child following, uh, for following the rules and using non-physical, non-hostile consequences for rule violations. Spend more time with your child, uh, carefully supervise their interactions, monitor their in activities, uh, become more engaged in the things that they're taking part in. Uh, build on your child's talents by encouraging them to get involved in pro-social activities. Um, all of those things can help your child uh, from this behavior. One of the things that I wanted to make sure to mention in my time today is cyberbullying tips because cyberbullying is the number one way in which conflict can actually turn into bullying because it ends up going online. 
um, and that differentiation between conflict between two people and bringing in other parties and outnumbering the person turns it into bullying. Um, there are tips from the district attorney from stop, block, and talk um, in which you can do. Uh, there are tips for the top 10 things uh, we wish all parents knew about technology and social media. You can find those guides online. But the biggest piece about stop, block, and talk truly is teaching children when someone asks them something personal or is rude to them online to immediately stop the communication block that person without feeling guilty or bad about it and to tell a trusted adult when they need help or when something like this has happened. Recognize the signs of cyberbullying, things like your child becoming obsessed over technology, becoming withdrawn from regular activities, um, help them to understand to ignore distressing emails like we we're talking about, stop the interaction. Um, ignore the messages and comments, block the person immediately. Um, it is important to save evidence of what's going on, um, take screenshots, print or preserve, write down the date and time of something that had occurred so that when you do follow up with it, you're able to provide that information to the school. Um, to follow uh, procedures of having hurtful web pages removed, lots of social media sites do have steps you can take to get blogs or things taking down if they're hurtful in nature. Um, get the school involved immediately. Tell somebody about it, like we were saying before. Know the procedures and who to go to. And then, of course, monitor the use of internet and social media. Become familiar with the social media they're using. Um, Stop, Block, and Talk also has their own social media site for education for parents. You can find them on Instagram for Stop, Block, and Talk. You see um, it here on the bottom of the screen. And it gives some helpful tips to assist parents when teaching their children about the use of online and what they're posting as well. One of the things that I had seen on there that I thought was really helpful was think before you post, helping children to ask themselves, is what I'm posting true? Is it helpful to people? Is it inspiring in some way? Is it necessary to post? And is it kind? Um, some of the enforcement and compliance with this, um, just so that you have this information as well. Uh, the suggestion is always first contact your school district or personnel um, when there is an issue. The principal, the superintendent, the administrator of special education, the school counselor, this is who you should go to first as a parent. But if for some reason you don't believe that things are being tended to appropriately in a timely manner, or um, you don't believe that the school is following the procedure that they should, you can go to um, the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE, the one that we were talking about earlier, who oversees all of these laws and procedures that schools have to tend to. Um, there is a problem resolution system office within DESE, um, which you can find either on the DOE mass.edu website or calling them directly and discussing your concerns. And off, also the Office for Civil Rights, if you do, do believe that there was a civil rights violation that wasn't tended to appropriately. Um, and their information is there on the screen as well, the ocr.boston at ed.gov or the phone number um, to enter a complaint if you have concerns. Um, that sort of sums up the bullying sort of presentation that I have for today. I hope, in, I hope to open it up for questions. I see that there are some chats that uh, I'd be happy to answer or talk about. Yeah, um, thank you, Justine. That was wonderful. Um, and yes, we do have um, some questions coming in through the chat box, so I can read those out loud to you and you can respond. Um, so our first question is, how would a parent or a family recognize if their child is um, bullying another child? That's a great question. And we went over some of the 
sort of warning signs. And I don't think that there's any sure way to know specifically, rather than um, just sort of picking up on some of these things like the dislike for school, refusal to go to school, stomach aches or other physical complaints that the child may have, negative self-talk, uh, self-harm or loss of confidence, sudden change in behavior for the child. And I think the most important thing to do is point this out to your child, have an open conversation, talk with them about your concerns, about some of the behavior changes that you've seen, ask them if something is going on. Um, express that it isn't their fault if something that is, hap is happening and that you want to be able to help them. They deserve to be safe and get a good education um, and that you can help them. There are steps that can be taken. Um, help them to feel in control of things. Share with them that you want to work with them to make them feel safe and better. Um, so I think that would probably be the best way to pick up on things and then be open, honest, transparent, and um, create a safe space for your child to tell you. There also might be a trusted adult in your family or family constellation that the child uh, shares things with openly um, more so than yourself, maybe a sibling of yours or a sibling of theirs, um, and really being able to let them know when you have concerns or check in with them um, and express the importance of involving you in those conversations. Okay. Um. Okay, so our next question. If someone's child is acting as a bully, um, what can parents do to stop, prevent, or mitigate that behavior? I think the most important thing is to remember not to confront somebody yourself. Go to the school. Allow the school and the procedures that they have to talk with that family, that child, and get that child the resources as well. Remember, children don't particularly follow a particular profile, right? Bullying is a behavior. It's not a label of a child. If someone is being a bully or you hear about them bullying, um, it very well could be that they're being bullied as well. They also need support and resources, social emotional assistance, um, how to be a good friend, education, it could be a developmental issue or skill sets that they need to, or it could be a cry out for something bigger happening to the child some other way. So really having the professionals handle this situation and um, having them explore what's going on for this child and putting in the proper resource is the most important. Perfect, thank you. Um, excuse me, our next question. What advice would you have for bullying that occurs outside of school um, between children who don't go to school together, but they might live in the same neighborhood or play together on a sports team or other activity together? I think, uh, you know, this comes up a lot. And if the school can't get involved, given that it's different districts, you may be able to involve others. So for example, if it's um, an activity that they're doing, talking to the coach about what's going on and the ways that they prevent bullying on that team or any sort of like hazing or other, you know, labels that you have for bullying. Um, really, you know, encouraging them for the bystander effect, you know, other kids encouraging them to say, come on, let's get out of here, or it's not nice to talk that way, or <laughs> we're all friends, um, other sorts of intervention. And you may witness some of it and be able to do some of that intervention yourself, um, just mm -hmm. saying, you know, uh, and encouraging your child to, um, you know, have pro-social behaviors with everybody and what's going on. Okay. But I would say, you know, if it's happening outside of certain school districts, it wouldn't hurt to also involve the school counselor of your child to help them either with um, getting help, talking to somebody, or if there's any support they need, and or the other child. Okay, great. Um, I think you touched on this earlier, but if you could expand on it, um, what are some strategies that you would recommend to kids on how to handle being bullied in the moment, uh, maybe walking away or using humor um, or some other strategies that you would recommend? I think that talking with kids is really important and giving them what I call like one-liners, like you said, um, like we were talking about before, like, come on, let's get out of here, or that's really not nice. I don't appreciate talking to me like that. I'm going to walk away, or that's not really how I would want to be treated. Um, that's not a friendly way of communication, or um, that actually is mean, it's hurting my feelings, I'm going to walk away from this situation now and telling a trusted adult. 
um, I think the stop, block, and talk is the most important, right? Stop the communication, um, you know, block the person if it's cyberbullying or remove yourself from the situation and tell a trusted adult so they can help you to um, remove yourself from that situation and stop further bullying from happening. Great. Um, okay, our next one. Um, it says, my son is going into full day kindergarten next year with a larger class size. Is this a good time to start having a conversation about bullying? I think having the conversation of being a good friend is really important and starting age appropriate discussions at any time. Um, he's going to be making a lot of friends, new friends, different interactions and connections with people and giving him language for that and pro-social behaviors. We always want to focus on the positive and the strengths of somebody, um, really helping and encouraging them around bystander um, effects. And remember age appropriate things. Kindergarten isn't a time I think where kids really understand the impact sometimes on someone else. So education is really heavy and pro-social friendly behaviors and increasing those behaviors, rewarding those behaviors, encouraging those behaviors is the most important. Um, you should also <laughs> check in with how the school does that already. I'm sure it's part of the social emotional learning that they have in kindergarten and as they're coming together and being able to foster some of that at home is gonna be really important. Okay, um, excellent. Um, our next question is, what would you recommend to families and children if they do not feel safe um, or comfortable confronting a bully? Where, where should they turn and what should they do? I think it's important to always turn to those that are proficient in managing these situations. Um, there is somebody designated at every single school who is the head of in, foreseeing these procedures at the school level. So going to somebody and talking about it is important. If safety is ever an immediate concern, um, the sooner getting to somebody and talking about that, the better. Um, the school has to ensure the safety and well-being, and they have procedures in place at every level of bullying, from things like name calling all the way through to physical violence of what they're able to do to keep a child safe and allow them to get the education they deserve. So that's going to be the first stop and my recommendation for the first stop of every parent or child. Okay, excellent. Um, or it looks like we have two more. Um, our next one is what can a family or child do if the bully or bully's family denies or does not change the bullying behavior? That's a really great question. It's sort of like what is within our control and what isn't. And I would say the most important thing is to focus on what your child needs. And if the bullying doesn't stop or the behaviors don't stop to your child, continuing to advocate for your child through the procedures that the school has or the system has um, is really important. Legal advice is always something that is an option if it's seen as harassment. And we have laws in Massachusetts to protect children for that reason. So um, there is a chance that people could seek out if um, the bullying constitutes harassment and if they're able to get things like harassment orders. Um, it's important to understand the laws around that, get legal counsel around that, and talk with your school around that as well. Okay, excellent. Um, our last question, um, it looks like we might be able to wrap up a little bit early. Um, so our last question is, when should the police versus school administration become involved in a bullying situation? So there's a chance that the police will become involved with any of those civil rights violations that we talked about of the protected classes, as mm -hmm. well as any sort of uh, sexual harassment, racial harassment, any of those sorts of things. When it falls in those categories, the school is mandated to let authorities know what has happened. So um, this is part of knowing the procedures um, of the school and knowing the rights that your, you and your child have and ensuring that you get the support that you deserve. Um, it is not uncommon uh, for parents to explore that with the police themselves as well and ensure that um, a school is following what they need to follow in terms of civil rights violations for children. Okay. 
Great. Um, oh, it looks like we have another question. Um, what resources do you recommend for middle school students to support them with bullying? There are some great resources to stop bullying now, as I was saying, Disney Channel has um, resources as well. If you go to the DESE website, Department of um, uh, Education and Secondary Education, they have some amazing resources. The district attorney's websites have resources for bullying. I can um, be sure to send out some of those resources as well for people to visit them. Um, the Stop, Block, and Talk is a great resource. If you do have social media and being able to go on Instagram and follow that account, it has wonderful links and great help for parents of how to get involved. They actually do uh, trainings for parents to help your children as well. So we have the resource and connecting to it is really important. Also, every school has to have their procedures um, of uh, prevention and intervention either listed on their website or within the student handbook. So that's a great place to start as well for resources on bullying. Wonderful. Okay, um, just check one more time for other questions. Um, looks like that's it. Um, well, thank you so much, Justine. This is a really um, wonderful presentation. Of course, thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate you having me. Anytime. And if anyone's interested in the list of resources that Justin just shared, feel free to email the Blum Center. We'd be happy to share them with you. It's pflc at partners.org, and I can share that in the chat. I also mentioned that today's session is being recorded. So if you're interested in viewing the recording, you can visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center, and you'll be made available through there. Thank you so much, everyone. Hope you found today's session very helpful and have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks.